So, uh, so everybody, welcome to our fourth, sorry, our fifth presentation of the day, um, focusing on YRS Youth Rehabilitative Services. Um, and a couple housekeeping things. This is a webinar, so if this is your first one you're attending today, um, we will not be able to see you or hear you. You'll just be able to see and hear the speakers. So if you have questions, utilize the Q&A box that should be at the bottom of your screen. And Michelle is gonna be the one monitoring that. So if you have a question, plug that in the Q&A box. And then when our presenter has a, has a chance to pause and ask if there's any questions, then Michelle will go ahead and read your question there. So because we are reading the questions, try to make them clear because we won't be able to kind of guess what you're asking for. So, um, all right, so <laughs> perfect. Working on some background and background I, stuff. I did say, Judge Kudin made a comment, I did say, and I am struggling because I have so many plants on my windowsill here. So I'll have to take them all down to close my blinds, Judge Kunin. So, you know what? You're going to share your screen anyway. So, so that's I okay. my screen. So, um, I haven't seen most of you for some time, but I don't think you need to see me for the presentation. How about that? That's all right. So why don't you, why don't we do this, Renee? Why don't you start sharing your screen and Michelle, you can introduce Renee. Sounds like a plan. Thank you everybody for joining us for the one o'clock session for Delaware's child welfare response uh, to the COVID pand pandemic, the YRS perspective. Our presenter today began her career in juvenile justice with the Division of Youth Rehabilitative Services in 2000 as a family service specialist juvenile probation officer. A year later, Renee was promoted to senior probation and parole officer and joined the Serious Juvenile Offender Unit. In 2005, Renee was promoted to Family Crisis Therapist Supervisor at Snowden and Grace Cottage. And in 2007, she became a Family Services Program Support Administrator, supervising the statewide Family Court Liaison Unit. In late 2007, Renee was promoted to Regional Manager in YRS Community Services. And in 2012, Renee joined Family Court as a Newcastle County Director of Operations. In July of 2017, Renee left Family Court to return to the Division of Youth Rehabilitative Services as Deputy Director of the Division overseeing the Secure Care Facilities, a Fair School, Newcastle County Detention, the Residential Cottages, and Stevenson House Detention. Today, she will discuss the temporary changes YRS has implemented for detention, visitation, the processing of clients, and how POs are working with youth. I'll turn it over to Renee. Thanks very much, Michelle. That was very good. Um, so we'll get started. Um, so again, um, Renee Sakani, Deputy Director of YRS. So just a quick overview for those who are not familiar with the agency. So YRS is the lead juvenile justice agency serving youth who are court ordered through the system, as well as youth who are um, diverted through our system through civil citation. Um, we're responsible for assessing the needs of youth and collaborating with their families, schools, and support systems to coordinate services aimed at addressing the factors that contribute to delinquency. We're also responsible for um, community supervision, alternatives to detention, and secure care, which are detention centers, Ferris School, and cottages. So ultimately, the goals of our division is to reduce recidivism, enhance public safety, and promote positive youth outcomes. But just some fun things like I thought to start during COVID for us. So this is the front door of Ferris School. So the YRS administration really wanted to boost our staff's morale when COVID hit. Um, so we went over to Ferris and we cut out paper and put it on the front door for our staff who literally came to work day in and day out to help our kids. So we, we were, we're proud of that um, and we thought it was a fun slide. Also to continue our funness. So during COVID, we had to do a little differently during COVID. So some happy things. Um, so we did drive by staff recognitions. So this is an example. That's the director, John Stevenson, Michelle, the chief and myself. We had a drive by recognition in Dover. Um, we love to be with our friends and we love to be with our staff. Um, but obviously, we, you know, we could not have a full recognition in 2020. So we did drive-bys and it was awesome. It was great to see everybody. We, we followed all the COVID precautions. So something fun to kind of start with. Um, my last fun slide, um, again, like during the summer times, it was nice and warm out. We did some parking lot appreciation barbecues for our secure care staff. So this is the Ferris School. Um, this is our this is the superintendent um, and our chaplain and they're cooking for the staff um, coming through shift change. So it's kind of like a fun day. We were able to social distance outside, um, just provide some morale boosting for our staff during these rough times. 
So getting into kind of the nitty gritty of COVID. So when COVID first started in March, um, we literally had to like, halt everything we normally did for our for operations. Um, so some of the things that we did immediately was obviously our secure care staff had their central employees had to continue coming to work every day. Um, we sent our probation staff and all non-central employees out of offices across the state. So remember March 13, sending an email out like you guys are out of offices. It's it's you know take your computers, take your desktops, take, take your computers, take your phones, take your whatever you need to do your work at home. So. Thankfully, we were well equipped to do so. So under Chief Darling's um, direct administration over the past few years, we were able to purchase the Surface Pros for our POs. So they really went out seamlessly. And um, everybody has a smartphone as well. So they were well equipped to go out um, and do their work remotely. We also instituted daily calls with our division leadership and department leadership to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, share information, um, and just basically address issues and concerns. Every single day there was something new that came up. Um, one big thing too, we also removed all non-essential employees and contractors and education staff from our facilities um, just to reduce the risk of spread to our youth. Um, we quickly brought back education staff in. Uh, we tried remote learning and we still have a hybrid of remote learning and I'll get to that during my presentation, but it didn't work full remote um, for obvious reasons. Michelle, any questions so far? Okay. You're good to keep going. Okay, thank you. Um, so obviously what we did right away was we you know, did all the got, we research, and implemented all the CDC and DPH guidelines. Um, I put PBH, it should have been DPH, I apologize on that. Um, so obviously, you know, staff mass, we did a staff mass mandate from the, from the division director um, for all our facilities. We, um, we, we encourage social distancing when applicable. Obviously in our residential facilities, there are times when we have to get closer than that to either address a situation or safety risks. So, you know, when applicable, we have to be covered to six feet. Um, we installed sanitizer stations. We, you know, encourage staff to in increase hand washing. So actually one funny story about sanitizer. So I know most of you remember this, sanitizer was very difficult to get a hold of back in March. And we started running fairly low, fairly quickly. Um, when, when the pandemic hit. So I had seen on, I saw on Facebook that there was actually a distillery in Milford that was selling hand sanitizer. So I sent my secretary down on, on a mission to get gallons of hand sanitizer at $80 a pop, but the first few months just to get hand sanitizer into the building. So um, until we could get some bulk orders in. So we tried to be as creative as we possibly could to get our, the supplies we needed. We were, we were prepared um, for the for this to happen as far as supplies, but it just dwindled quickly. Um, same with PPE. So we 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 contact with Christiana Care to provide medical services for our youth in the facilities, and they have traditionally been responsible for ordering PPE. So that actually was very helpful for us during this time because they were able to tie into some of their medical um, providers and the hospital contractors to get us the PPE we needed for our facilities. Um, so that was helpful. Um, so we literally had a knee jerk you know, and we had developed all new processes and procedures like in March. So um, we had to develop a new COVID pro screening protocol for both staff and youth. So for the youth, we had temperature screens done daily by our Christianity Care medical staff. Um, we actually had little town halls with each youth in the facility to educate them on the virus because they were very scared, right? They were, they were hearing from people. They didn't really know what was going on. You know, watching TV it was very scary to them. So we had our Christiana care team with our staff educate the kids on what the virus meant, what the symptoms were, and the importance of self-monitoring and reporting. Like you can't not tell us you have a sore throat, right? So that's kind of what we did. We encouraged and we continue to encourage them. So just one thing as, as well, we didn't require the, the kids to wear masks at the beginning of the pandemic in the facility. So we see the facilities as they used home while they're with us, right? We hope to treat them that way. And we saw them once they got post their quarantine period, which I'll talk to about in a minute, that they did not have to wear masks on their housing units um, because that's their home. And we didn't all wear masks in our homes and we still don't. Um, but for staff, we developed a, a screening protocol for all staff. So temperature take were taken every time they come into the building. So if they come in for their shift, they go back out for their break and come back in, they got their temperature retaken. 
Um, and we also developed a list of screening questions um, develop with, with guidance from public health, um, including questions like, have you been in close contact with anybody with, with COVID-19? If there's any, if staff had a temperature or if they said yes to any screening questions, we sent them right back out the building. Um, and we put them out and they were able to, they were able to apply for PEL for that, um, which is um, the emergency leave during COVID. Um, and of course, staff had that mandatory mask mandate. Michelle, any questions? We do have one question, uh, a general question about whether the PowerPoint will be available after the presentation. I'm not sure if Lauren's still on or not, but I do know the presentation is being recorded and will be available probably starting next week. So the PowerPoint will be there. Yeah, and Renee, if you if you are okay with it, you could email it to me and I can send it out to everybody if you're okay with that. Absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. Yep, okay. So some of the COVID precautions that we did like in-house as well. So we were able to, um, about in the summertime, because we were trying really hard to buy temperature scanners. So we were actually using a, a person, like a body, to take staff temperatures. So the temperature scanners, the hands-free scanners, we were able to purchase and put in the facility, so that's been helpful. We bought um, disinfectant fogger machines for the facilities. So we fogged the buildings preventively, preventively excuse me, and we've also fogged post a COVID positive youth or staff. Um, we bought industrial air purifiers for the facilities. Um, of course, the PPE. Um, we added some limited term custodial staff for extra cleaning in our buildings. Um, we added con contractor day porters to wipe down high traffic areas like doorknobs, um, desks, things like that. And then we also contracted with a vendor to spray disinfect the facilities weekly. So similar to like the schools are doing, we have somebody come in weekly into all the buildings and spray the buildings down, including the housing units, which has been fairly effective. These are just some pictures of what we purchased. So um, the ones, the fogger, I thought it was fun to show. This is the air purifier and the temperature scanners, which are amazing. Um, they work great. One thing I always do say though is that We've had a lot of folks that unfortunately that have tested positive, both staff and youth, and um, temperatures haven't been their main uh, so symptom. So that also is, is becoming a concern as we move along with COVID as well as, we, as, as things change. Things change. Um, so just as most of the court staff is aware, we, um, we had to develop some detention intake protocols. So kids, detention is usually the first point of entry into our residential system. So we, separate the youth when they come into the building for 14 days on a quarantine unit. Um, those youth on that unit were, are required to mass, wear masks and were required to wear masks from day one of, of a pandemic started. Those youth that come in the building, they are our biggest risk of spread because um, they were in the community, we're not sure what they were doing or who they were around. So they, they come in, um, the quarantine unit is, we typically try to staff that with the same staff as well for risk of reduced spread. Um, and there's also a nurse, assigned nurse to the unit in both buildings, both in Newcastle County and Stevenson House. So youth are COVID rapid tested upon admission and they also get a PCR test, which is the test that's sent out. Um, but it's a, it's a voluntary test. So parent and youth have to consent. So we call the parent first. Um, and we've had, we've had parents deny. Either if the youth wants it, um, if the parent says no, then we, we don't do it. Um, so if a parent says yes and the youth says no, so we try to talk to that youth about the benefits of it, um, but if they eventually stick their heels in, we don't move forward on that as well, but they have to stay on the 14 day quarantine unit. Um, and we just monitor symptoms on that quarantine unit as well. Um, we've been going through this for almost a year now. We've only had two youth this whole time that have walked in the door positive, so that's a good thing. Um, so again, on that unit, temps are taken twice a day. Unlike the typical buildings where they're taken once a day, this unit is twice a day. The mask mandate after 14 days are moved off that unit back into regular populations. Um, so what we also did was we, we purchased these fun little carts um, to have more ability to have remote court hearings. So I know back in March, everybody went remote. We had one um, piece of equipment for each detention center. We never thought we would need to go full remote. So we bought a few of these carts that were able to wheel around to the unit. So if a kid on the quarantine unit has, needs to have a bail hearing or a court hearing, we can roll this onto that unit and we can have that Zoom hearing. Um, we also use these for clinical visits, probation visits, whatever we need it, we need it for. Um, they've been very helpful for us. 
I don't think we've skipped a beat with missing hearings because of either COVID positive youth or because of um, the quarantine units. So for our residential program, so detention is the pre-adjudication facility. Then youth are typically moved once adjudicated and sentenced to either Ferris school or the residential cottages um, if they need that level of care. So um, when the pandemic hit, um, we, we continue to provide all core programming. Nothing really stopped for the facilities. Um, a lot of our core programs are staff and minister. They go through training. That did not stop. We do have some support from the community and contracts on some additional um, evidence-based programming, such as yoga, victim sensitivity, and risks and decisions. Um, and we were able to do those programs as well remote. Um, so that was that was very good. Um, they would sometimes there was some paperwork that would be provided by the contractors. We work with the kids on those, but for the most part, we've been able to do things all remote. So back in March, again, we for visitation, we halted visitation in March. So we were we use a um, custom notification system called Mir Three. We were able to mass notify all the parents of all our kids in the facilities that we were can't we were stopping visitation because of the pandemic. Um, so we did visitation full virtual, meaning FaceTime, um, Zoom, um, through July of 2020. So we were able to restart in July because the numbers decreased and the community spread in July. Um, we were allowing one parent or guardian to come in at a time. We were pre-scheduling the visits. Um, we were taking all the COVID precautions, cleaning before and afterward, this social distancing, mask wearing. The families, the parent or guardian had to answer all the COVID screening protocols similar to what our staff do. So that actually went very well. But then in July, we had a halted again because of the a spread, the spread increases. I'm sorry, November, I'm sorry, we suspended again in November because of the increase in community spread. Um, but again, during this time, we've increased parent phone calls um, and we've increased that still at FaceTime and virtual. So we're still right now at a time where we are halted visitation, but we are hoping in the next couple of months, we're able to, to increase back to a mix of that hybrid uh, in-person and virtual for visitation. Um, so for education, again, I think I spoke a little bit on this. So we um, provide a mix of remote and in-person education. So there are education staff in person every day in the facilities. Um, and there's a mix of, of remote. So some teachers are actually remoting in and the kids are in the classroom in school every day. So we haven't skipped a beat on education. We continue to provide services um, to the kids for education. Um, also all clinical services, so all assessments that are needed, all count individual one-on-one -on -one counselings, again, the same way. So we have psychologists on staff as well as family crisis therapists. They are a mix of in-person and hybrid. Um, and we, we haven't missed a beat as far as being able to, to connect youth to any behavioral health services. Um, we also instituted back in March a bi-weekly review of all residential cases led by myself. So it's all the division heads, including Chief Darling, we all get on the phone and we review every single youth in residential care, whether it be cottages, Ferris, and the detention centers, to kind of see where they are in meeting their goals, determining if maybe we could discharge sooner um, or they need to stay longer. And for the youth in detention, if there are any hiccups with um, moving their cases along, we just have some oversight to be able to move those cases along. Um, so we've actually just started um, kind of decreasing the need for that because the cases seem to be moving pretty quickly through the system and kids are meeting their goals in the facilities and we seem to be doing well. So we've actually decreased that to about between three to four weeks now we have a case review of all the youth in the facilities. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so probation. So again, probation didn't skip a beat. When they went out, they were so ready to go out as far as being prepared with their, with their documentation and their equipment. Um, so for the first few months of COVID, it was all virtual visits. So it definitely it was definitely all FaceTime visits with the family, with the youth. Um, we know the kids have cell phones, so it was actually really good. It was actually better than making home visits. We don't, well, they don't show up when you get there, but it actually worked well. Uh, we started doing some home visits um, when needed for some, some POs just really felt that some kids really needed that face-to-face -face connection and we were okay with that as long as we were able to, you know, ensure that all the COVID-19 protocols were in place as far as social distancing and things like that. We made recommendations like meet at a park, meet outside, um, you know, meet somewhere, you know, out somewhere where you could, you could distance. Um, 
So right now it's currently a mix of in-person and virtual. And you know, of course, with everything that we do, we try to keep data and track. And there has been a significant increase in contact with our youth and families using the virtual platforms. Um, it's easier for them, right? All they have to do is pick up their phone and their PO's calling. They don't have to go to a home visit or office visit. You know, and the PO's know, for the most part, they're probably gonna get the kid. Um, again, we waste a lot of time driving to schools, to homes, and it's been really great for the POs. And I'll actually let Michelle chime in there if I missed anything on that. Uh, the only thing that I would add is that we make them follow the same sort of protocols, except instead of doing it in a building in terms of taking the temperature, making sure they're not exposed, um, they do the self-evaluation at home. Um, and then when they do meet with the youth and the family, they bring enough masks so that if the youth or the family doesn't have one, we're able to provide that for them. Do you mind if I jump, jump in and ask a quick question? How, how has that been re received? How has the virtual contact been received on behalf of the families? Have you gotten good feedback from the family's perspective? It's a really great question. So I'll say from a family's perspective, it's really been a blessing. Uh, you know, in order to come to an appointment, families have to find childcare, have to find transportation, um, may have to take time off from work. And with a virtual appointment, right, you can do that on your lunch break. It solves the problem of transportation, which statewide is an issue, but um, more of an issue in our Sussex County. Uh, and then that childcare issue, folks don't tend to always think about, okay, in order to take one kid to an appointment, I may have to figure out what to do with kid number two and kid number three. Um, so it's been really helpful in terms of family participation. For kids, they're used to having this as their uh, uh, conversation style. So the text message, the FaceTime uh, is, is more familiar for a teenager. So I think we were concerned initially about being able to develop and maintain rapport. But what we found is that we're actually having more contact, more contact on a more consistent basis. Okay, Michelle, any questions before I, I'm sure that we're raising questions. Uh, sure, there is a question uh, and it says, it sounds like things are working much better. Is there any thought to keeping things this way when the state gets back to quote unquote normal? Yes, so we've definitely been talking about that. Michelle can attest to that. Um, I mean, I think we're gonna find this is gonna be the best practice in juvenile justice going forward. Again, I think sometimes we forget, I mean, I, Feel like I'm young, but I know I'm not that young, right? I think I, I forget that, the, right, we need to remember, we need to see what works best for these kids. And, and Michelle's right, like we realize like, wow, these kids, they all have phones, they're on their phones, this is what they know. So I do think, I, think, I definitely think that we're gonna have to be um, cognizant of the way the world's just changed from a, to a virtual platform for most things, including our workforce. So we're, we're in discussions about the return to work for our workforce as well, because it's the same thing. The work's getting done very well. Um, Michelle's team, I mean, they had, they really picked it up. They absolutely were kept plugging. It, it was amazing. Um, you know, again, we were concerned about that at first, but we, we have the POs are saying that these families are grateful. The kids are grateful, you know? Um, so one, some funny things that, you know, when we first went out, we still wanted to keep curfew checks in place. We have a unit that does curfew checks. So we actually used to make the youth like go out of their house and show us that they were in front of their house with their address, like to make sure that they were actually home in their house. Cause usually we just drive by and go up and knock on the door. So, and that's worked really well. Like the kids are like, I'm here, let me go outside and show you. Like, let me show you the address. Let me show you what, the street, let me show you my corner. So it really has worked really well for us. Um, so it's a coordination with stakeholders because obviously we couldn't do a lot of this without some support from our stakeholders. Um, so just some, some family court co coordination. So um, we worked with the family court administration to develop an expedited hearing just for youth and residential treatment. Um, so you youth who are ready to go home, um, ready to discharge to, to aftercare that are on a definite commitment, there's a requirement in the statute for a certificate of discharge. And post pre-pandemic, we used to just file that. Um, and, and there's no requirement for judicial approval on that. We just file it and within 10 days, um, if there's no if there's no discourse, we could discharge the youth. So um, with a couple hearing officer suggestions, we developed this process and now the hearing officer is actually reviewing those discharges. And if they approve, we can release the youth uh, before their 10 days is up. So that's been helpful. Um, we also developed a process to allow youth to have initial bail hearings 
if arrested by a probation officer from our detention facilities instead of having to go to the courthouse and just cause more chaos at the courthouse and bring more people into the buildings. So we have one unit of um, officers, the Serious Juvenile Offender Unit, who was able to have arrest powers who were able to take youth into custody. So if they were wanted on a, on, on a family court capias, they would have traditionally brought the youth into the courthouse. So we work with the family court administration to allow us to bring the youth to one of our two detention centers, and then we will video bail in to um, the courthouse, whatever courthouse that the youth had to be heard in front of. And then if the youth was um, remanded, they would just stay there. And if they were ordered to go home or to an alternative, we would, we would then take the kid home or take them to the alternative. Um, so that, that was, that's been working out very well for us as well. Um, so again, we work with um, DOJ and ODS, um, let them know, like, listen, at the beginning, we were all virtual, like schedule an appointment. We gave them folks who, folks in each facility, they should reach out to to schedule virtual visits with the clients. Um, and we've actually had a few uh, attorneys that have requested to see the kids in person. And we have accommodated that. So right now it's a mixed, um, just need to make an appointment with our, our staff. Um, and we can, we can accommodate that. So we've got, you know, of course we need to have that coordination or else it wouldn't have been successful during this. Um, so as things started to change uh, and more information was known about um, COVID, we were able to, thankfully with the help of DEMA, um, we, were off, we were able to offer both staff and youth COVID testing. Now again, it's voluntary for both. Um, so prior to, prior to this, we were only offering youth on a, youth that were symptomatic would get, get a test. Um, but as of the fall, we were able to get tests, the availability of tests were better. Um, so again, for, for, so back, I think it was like September, we, were, we started offering staff um, tests. So staff get a link every two weeks um, through, the, through Vault as the vendor, and they can go on order a test and have it delivered to their home um, free of cost to take a COVID test. Um, so we've been offering that continuously since September. Um, and then for youth, Again, at intake, they get the, a test. Um, for youth, we do all rapids and we do the PCR test, which is the send out test. Um, so at intake, and then we do also have a rotation of facilities we do monthly. So this week it was Ferris in the Cottages, next week it's Stevenson House, following week it's Newcastle, then we start all over again. So we rotate weekly for the facilities, just ongoing testing, and that's not, um, that's not intake testing. If we do happen to have an outbreak in a facility, we will test more frequently. So our plan for an outbreak, outbreak is, is two or more kids that are testing positive in the facility in the same rotation. Um, we will test every five to seven days until we have, we have two rounds of no positives. Um, so until then, the kids are, 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 are confined to their housing unit, not to their rooms, to their housing unit. Education is brought to them, meals are brought to them, and we let them out groups at a time of their rooms so we can try to reduce the spread. Um, so again, parent must consent to the testing. Each use receives a rapid in the PCR. We typically get, we get results from the PCR within 48 hours, so that's been great. Um, and then youth that have tested positive, we don't retest them um, until approximately 90 days after their positive test. So they're good after they're positive. If they get one positive, we don't test them out to a negative. So if they're, if they're positive and we move them to our COVID isolation unit, um, we don't keep testing them. They don't get off that unit when they're negative because research has been telling us that people could test positive up to six months. So if you're positive, you're positive. And there's some guidelines that our medical department follows in reference to when youth come off as far as monitoring of symptoms and um, a time frame if you're asymptomatic. Michelle, any questions? Or I keep going? Nope. Feel free to keep going. All right, thank you. All right, so I uh, was speaking about the COVID isolation unit. So quickly, qu very quickly in like March or April, you know, we realized, oof, what if we get a COVID kid? Um, so we, we um, worked together with our superintendents in the facilities and our facility staff, and we determined that the best place for an isolation unit would be at Stevenson House in Milford. So Stevenson House tends to have a lower population based, based on, they have, a, they have a unit down there that has an a separate unit that has actually an, a separate entry to the building so we could easily have a isolation unit where it would be truly isolated staff would come in and out of a separate door and youth would come in and out of a separate door so that was our isolation unit um, so kids that were are transferred to the isolation unit have to have a positive test result not just displaying symptoms 
So we have a lot of kids that say, oh, I have a sore throat, or I, you know, we don't, we don't move them. They have to have a positive test. Um, there's a dedicated nurse assigned to that unit. So she is responsible for all the nursing care um, on that unit. Um, and able, in order, so in order to staff that unit with staff, we had to enter into an agreement with our local union, um, which actually weren't very seamless. Um, we uh, entered into an agreement that staff would volunteer for the unit and be chosen based on seniority. The staff were 12 hour shifts, either 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And they get 12 days on, excuse me, seven days on, seven days off. So they work seven, they're off seven. Um, there were some benefits to this unit uh, to, to volunteering as far as some increased overtime pay. Um, and of course, lower populations uh, to work with. Um, so youth on this unit still receive education via packets. If there's issues with some of the work that's done, we can FaceTime a teacher down the hall in the building to, to help the teacher help the youth get the, get the home get the work done. And of course, all clinical services are offered um, via FaceTime as well on that unit. We don't we don't allow anyone else to go on that unit except for those COVID staff and the youth. Um, so we purchased some handheld games for the kids for their free time, because um, obviously like the packets only get you so far and the, the education packets and they're not in normal program like they would be. Um, so uh, the average length of time the kids are on the unit is about 10 to 14 days, which not long, has not been long, um, but we wanted to keep them a little occupied as well. And then once the youth are recovered, um, based on the Christianity care guidelines, they're moved back to general population. Renee, we do have a question um, inquiring when a kid first enters Stevenson House, uh, do they go to the isolation unit automatically? No, so the, the, we actually have a, a quarantine unit at Stevenson House as well. So we have, a, we have two quarantine units, one at Newcastle and one at Stevenson. So all you, when they enter the building, they go right to the quarantine unit, not to be confused with isolation. So isolation is definitely the COVID positive kids. So they go on that quarantine unit for 14 days so we can monitor symptoms. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so just some successes during COVID. I mean, I, uh, so we've had reduced populations. Um, I, I, it's a national trend. So Michelle can attest, we talked to a lot of our colleagues in other states and we've had decreased populations in care. Uh, and we're just thankful at this time because that's helped us do our work and help us keep kids safe. Um, so our staff are coming to work. Um, we joke, we joked when COVID first started, there was nothing else to do. And some of us, some of our staff told us we want to be at work and not be home with our kids remote learning, right? So we're like, great, come to work. You want overtime? You can have it, right? So um, that worked out really well for us. And really staff are, they're really, they really come together as a team. For the staff that are working remotely, we've heard nothing but positive things. Better work-life balance for staff that are remote. And we know a lot of our staff have their own children. So it really has been beneficial. The work's getting done. Right, so you may have, if you have to stop for a couple hours during the day to help your help your child, you know, be on Zoom and remote learn. We know you're going to pick it up that evening from six to eight, right? That's just the reality of our workforce, and our staff have really been awesome through this. Um, we've really been happy that our, our symptoms have been mild for the most part for our youth that have that have um, become positive. Um, so, um, cold symptoms for the most part. And actually it's like half and half symptomatic and asymptomatic. So we've been grateful for that as well. No youth have ever had to be hospitalized due to COVID. Um, and again, they're getting off of that, off the isolation unit with that 10 to 14 days and very mild symptoms. So we're also really happy that we've been able to offer vaccines to our, our staff as well. We don't have any intention of offering vaccines to our youth. Um, uh, at this time, it's not recommended for the one vaccine, and the other vaccine is recommended for 16 and over. So at this time, we have no, no thought about recommending vaccines to our youth. Um, but we have had two vaccine clinics for staff so far, so we're hoping to get our staff vaccinated um, to be able to get them, you know, obviously, what we have seen through our youth positives in the facilities, um, the majority of youth positives, and I did have a number. So we've had 37 youth in our facilities test positive, and 31 are recovered. And besides those two youth who came in the building positive, everyone else, every other youth that um, had a positive test, they're getting it from staff. So staff are bringing it in, right? So we know this. We've had, we've had a good amount of positive staff, unfortunately. Um, we've had 65 positive staff in our bringing it into the kids, uh, not purposefully. So that's why we really, really encourage the staff testing. 
Um, and staff, again, could be asymptomatic, don't really have it, and they're bringing it in. That's just the risk that we have right now. Um, but we've seen also one kid gets it on a unit, the rest of the kids are getting it. So it, it's been, it's been, it's been, um, they've been very housing unit defined when we have many outbreaks. Um, so I guess we encourage our staff as well to be careful in the community because they're obviously, you know, what, what they do in the community affects what they do, what affects their work. Um, so we're, we're happy to be able to have some successes as well during COVID. So we do report out our numbers if anyone is interested um, on our uh, website. Um, it was up, updated weekly, so I did this PowerPoint a couple weeks ago. So I, these, these, these are the numbers that were uploaded on 2.9, but the link's on there, and I'll share this PowerPoint, but you can go on there, and I'll tell you how many youth and staff by building have tested positive, um, how many are recovered as well. So that is the end of my PowerPoint, um, and how YRS has managed through, through, through COVID. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, we'll give people a couple minutes, see if they have any questions. But, um, but I do have a question. How has YRS interacted with PBH and DFS, specifically for kids in DFS custody? Has anything changed about the way you offer services to children who are in DFS custody? No, not really at all. I mean, Michelle, could you think of anything specific? Um, go ahead. So we're still approaching it under the same auspice that we did when we were working in offices and just a floor apart from one another or a cubby apart from one another. Uh, the only difference is, you know, we're communicating through Skype or through phone calls. Um, I think one of the drawbacks is that because people are busier on phone calls and with Skypes, um, the communication can be a little bit slower. Um, but, uh, I think the collaboration is still there. Um, so we're, we're kind of doing the same as we did in offices. Wonderful. I'm shocked. There's not more questions. You, you have done a great job, Renee. This is, this is a lot, this is great information. It's been, it's been a, it's been a challenging year. I think we were stronger for it. Um, really made us really think our workforce, everybody's really risen to the, risen to the task here. So it has been great, really. Um, you know, we're sad that we were spreading the, the COVID in our facilities, we're very sad about that, but we're able to manage it. So, you know, it's one good thing. Uh, we do have a comment in the Q&A section saying, uh, working in healthcare, I want to say, I certainly know how many challenges you have had and I am grateful and thankful for how you have handled things. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then we have a question for, oh, it disappeared, so <laughs> never mind. No, it was for me, and I can I can address it to everybody. So any CASA volunteer who's attending, um, they need to get training hours per year. They need to get 12 total training hours a year. And they were asking, and I've had this question a couple of times, if they need to fill out a form or anything to verify that they did their training. And I'll say no, because I get a printout of who attended after this. So you don't have to do any CASA volunteer. You don't have to do anything um, to get your training credit. I'll give it to you. <laughs> Great, Lauren. Thank you. Um, that does make me think, Renee and, and Michelle, both of you, I guess, about um, continuing education or anything for your staff. I mean, is that something they have to do on a regular basis um, in terms of, I don't, I'm not quite sure exactly what types of training, but is there um, training they have to kind of get every year and has that training now kind of gone virtual or what does training sure. and communication look like? So I'll start and then Michelle can kind of pick up as well for her specific to the community services staff. So our, our secure care staff, have, everybody in the, the, the department, it was a secretary man's initiative, everybody gets 40 hours of training a year. Um, and our staff in our secure care facilities have to get the core, core trainings yearly. So CPR and first aid have to be recertified yearly. Also our restraint technique handle with care is a mandatory um, yearly retraining. So we've continued that virtually and there's a test out hands on after it. So we've continued that virtually for the most part. Um, my understanding from our training academy is that they actually received a, um, a training from um, I'm trying to think of for, for CPR and first aid that is able to be done virtually as well. So people are getting certified virtually in CPR and handle with care. But I think most of the world has gone to that virtual platform um, and modified whatever in-person trainings that we have to have um, virtually. Michelle, did you have any follow-up on that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of the blessings of COVID uh, that we had some opportunities to work on training, particularly in those early spring months uh, when the world just seemed to stop for just a, a little bit. And so we were able to build out some in space programming, risk need responsivity, implicit bias, adolescent development. All of that is being offered virtually. Um, and for a short time, um, though I hear it's a little bit different now, um, that, much the same as the kids are in a classroom and the teacher is virtual. Um, some of the trainings like CPR, the staff was in the classroom socially distanced, um, but the trainer was appearing virtually. So we've, we've been able to make it work and maybe have even upped the degree of the type of training and, and quality of training that folks are receiving. That's awesome. Good for you guys. Mm -hmm. All right, so I don't see any other questions. So this is kind of the last call if anybody has questions. We do have a question that just came through. Um, how are defense attorneys remaining in contact with detained youth to discuss resolution of charges um, or for trial preparation? So that, that's a good question. So I know that, they, that we have a, a central contact in each facility that the, the attorneys can call and schedule a virtual visit with them. But Michelle, you might be able to be clear on this one as far as um, the day actually the day of the hearing. Isn't there like like a separate like little like area they could go to, to to talk about the case before the actual hearing? Help me with that. I think there is a waiting room for that. Um, and just the follow up is also prior to trial. Um, so it's my understanding that on the day of the hearing, those links are being sent out by the court. Um, and then in the facilities, I think you talked about this, but maybe you just want to go over that again. Right. So yeah, they def so they make a schedule an appointment and we're, we're very flexible as those carts that we have, we can roll that around to a youth um, and we can put the youth in a, in a separate room to talk to their attorneys. Um, but again, virtual business have been increased with attorneys as well. Um, there are a couple uh, posted post diversion coordinators, excuse me, post, post sentencing coordinators that work for the Office of Defense Services that work with our kids in the residential care. So after the youth are sentenced, they, they come and talk to the youth, they make sure all their needs are being met and they're meeting with the kids like weekly, virtually um, on, on video. So it seems to be going well. All right, then, if there's no follow up questions, I think we can wrap this session up and Renee and Michelle, I want to thank you both and Renee, this PowerPoint is wonderful. If you don't mind, if you're okay with me sharing it with people, if you don't mind sending it to emailing it to me, then I can email it out to everybody who's attended today um, and go from there. Thank you, everyone.